everybody and, and welcome to this this IMAKI event. Uh, thank, thank you everyone for signing up. Uh, fantastic event we've got here today uh, with Rolls-Royce SMR. So this event is hosted by myself, Anthony Buckley, on behalf of the IMAKI Derby and Nottingham Young Members Panel. Um, we have Tom Sampson with us today, who's the CEO of the newly established Rolls-Royce SMR business. Tom, it's great to have you here. Uh, and we look forward to understanding a bit more about how the Rolls-Royce SMR and the, this technology can have a great contribution towards the net zero goal of the UK. So just before I hand over to you, Tom, I'm going to play a short video, uh, which just sets the scene really uh, of what Rolls-Royce SMR is trying to achieve. The UK target for net zero carbon emissions by 2050 is ambitious. To achieve this, we need more clean electricity to power a future that enables us to develop, to grow, to prosper. Our target to decarbonize cannot be met by intermittent renewables alone. The challenge is on us all. We must act now. At Rolls-Royce, we have the answer. The Rolls-Royce SMR is a low-cost, clean energy solution. Made in the UK for industrial, utility and energy customers. A factory-built nuclear power plant. Transported to site as modules and assembled in a specially designed on-site factory. Radically reducing construction activity. Creating a fully integrated nuclear power plant. And an architecturally beautiful structure. The Rolls-Royce SMR is scalable, versatile and innovative. It can be deployed across a variety of applications, creating new opportunities to meet a range of clean energy needs. Capable of operating at availability levels of 95%, 24 hours a day, 7 days a week, for 60 years. A twin SMR can also provide 100% availability of clean electricity for customers who need an always-on solution. This unique N plus one configuration not only ensures access to clean energy all day, every day, but will also produce large volumes of surplus clean power, which can be used for other off-grid solutions, such as hydrogen production, synthetic aviation fuels, and desalination. The Rolls-Royce SMR uses proven and commercially available products, allowing it to deliver a competitive, low-cost solution, creating delivery certainty, reducing risk and building investor confidence, and creating jobs. Lots of jobs. The challenge is on us all. We must act now for all our futures. We are Rolls-Royce. Our SMR is powering a clean energy future. We are pioneering the power that matters. So I guess it's now for me to hand over to you, Tom. Thank you, thank you very much. I was really pleased when you asked me to come along and speak to the IMEC -E, uh, members today. Um, about 32 years ago, I was involved in the Young Generation Network at IMEC -E. I was on the Power Industries Board at IMEC -E when I worked in GC Alstom in Trafford Park back when we were designing combined cycle power plants. So again, involved in designing power plants back then, uh, a member of the uh, IMEC -E. And so I was really, really quite pleased to, to be invited to come along. I used to have to organise speakers for these types of events back in the in the 90s and I'm, I'm just reflecting as well 1990 was 32 years ago if I was speaking to somebody like me and as a young young engineer they'd have started their career in 1958 uh, to be comparable to get to 1990 so I, I feel slightly a bit of a di dinosaur so bear with me as a as I try and keep up with the all the youngsters on on this on this call um, but it's, it's great to be here and it's also really timely given that we've just launched Rolls-Royce uh, SMR Limited in the last few weeks, a uh, culmination of lots of effort over the last uh, 18 months as we've delivered phase one of our program with our consortium partners and then moved from that into a newly established uh, legal entity called Rolls-Royce SMR Limited with Rolls-Royce still the majority shareholder, 
but we've brought in new capital from new investors who are going to join us on this journey uh, as shareholders in Rolls Royce SMR Limited um, and allowing us to then access the grant funding that will then give us equivalent of four hundred and ninety million pounds to take the technology forward through the next the next phase of the program. We've brought in alongside Rolls Royce BNF Resources uh, and as well as them uh, who are a financial investor um, and as well as uh, BNF Resources, we've also brought in Exelon generation and that that excellent for i mean most of you will probably have heard of them they're a u.s utility they're the largest uh, commercial operator of nuclear assets uh, globally and they achieve what is recognized as some of the highest performance standards in operating nuclear assets so having them as a shareholder is a real badge of honor for from our design and from our technology perspective they had the option to invest in any smr technology globally and they chose to invest in rolls royce smr uh, because they believe that's the technology that will get delivered <clears throat> and, and taken forward, not just in the UK, uh, but globally. Uh, and it's also timely that we're having this conversation uh, at the, uh, shortly after COP26. And I think for me, COP26 was really an indication that nuclear is seen now firmly as part of the solution. There are always skeptics out there. There's always people who will have, have a, a vocal voice uh, uh, in relation to nuclear and its challenges. But I think that the, the, the discourse has changed. People realise now the scale of climate change ahead of us uh, and the challenge in, in, in getting to net zero and beyond. Uh, and, and those who've thought about this and understand the, the scale of that challenge now recognise that nuclear needs to be part of the solution. And I think there was lots of people from the Young Generation Network in the nuclear industry up at COP26 in the blue zone talking about nuclear and bringing nuclear to life in a way that I thought was really quite inspirational as well. And I think that that, that for me has been a turning point in, in looking at how we how we bring nuclear forward and, and a great a great time for us then to be talking about a completely different way of making nuclear uh, happen with our Rolls Royce SMR. Now I'm going to share with you today uh, a little bit about how we're how we're planning to make that happen. So, yeah, I'll give you a little bit of an introduction as to who Rolls Royce SMR Limited are. But this is not something that we've we've we're starting from. Uh, afresh. No, our team in Rolls Royce SMR Limited that have transferred over into that business now have got a long, long uh, history of working with nuclear technology from Rolls Royce's uh, deep knowledge from the submarine uh, part of our business uh, in providing the nuclear reaction technology uh, for the propulsion of the of the nuclear navy fleet. And so that heritage in nuclear design and nuclear manufacturing, people that have uh, designed and developed the PCO. The engineering teams that have designed the reactor technologies in the submarine fleet are built into the, the organizational capabilities that we've got within Rolls-Royce SMR Limited. And I think that's a really important starting point, given that we are now trying to take this technology to market. That pedigree, that heritage, that experience really differentiates us uh, in, in the SMR world. And it's something that we are really, really proud of and, and intend, intend to build on. And, and we do need to move at pace with nuclear energy. If you look back at the last 25 years or so, nuclear hasn't been as, as, uh, as widely deployed as it should have been for a variety of factors. Some of the global incidents that have taken place, some of it related to the challenges of going large uh, and what that meant in terms of deliverability of, of some of these large and more complex programs. But as you can see from the, 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 the carbon footprint across Europe, no, the challenges of getting to a net zero economy um, is really hard. You can see the countries that are already there are countries that have either got a massive potential of uh, hydro, uh, but also nuclear. No, Sweden, France have got combinations of nuclear plus other, other forms of clean energy. And the ones that have most uh, uh, developed and deployed nuclear today are the ones that have got the cleanest grids. Uh, and it also brings to life that but whilst we in the UK have got you know, the benefits of being an island in terms of the ability to access large volumes of offshore renewable wind energy, that isn't the case across lots of Europe. And then particularly in Central Europe, where they haven't got any offshore wind and their ability to access onshore wind and solar is limited and their ability to access gas as a, as a form of base load uh, with carbon capture is also limited. So nuclear we're seeing is becoming a much more um, uh, viable solution in many countries that are now trying to work out how do they get to net zero by 
by 2050 and how do they decarbonize their grids from 2030 onwards so that's that's a really positive signal for us that demand is is global and is is quite unprecedented um, and this is more than just traditional grid connected power plants which is what you maybe normally associate with nuclear our technology can be collaborated and connected with other applications to help decarbonize some of the more harder to to, to clean up sectors, particularly around transport. Um, so we can produce hydrogen, we can produce synthetic aviation fuels, we can produce kind of power for, for helping uh, clean up the, uh, the transport sector, uh, but do it at a vast scale. And importantly, what we shouldn't forget is on a cost competitive basis. Uh, the UK economy, for example, has had the benefit of uh, oil and gas uh, reserves for many, many decades. Uh, we need to think about the cost competitiveness of how we produce these future clean fuels. And we believe the cost competitiveness of a base load SMR plant in that respect is very compelling. However, you look at the future projections of energy consumption, under all the scenarios, basically, we're going to need more electricity, either on the grid or off the grid, to produce these clean products. And um, in all scenarios, that electricity demand is going to be going to be higher uh, and plus the fact that we're already planning to decommission and take off the grid many of the emitting forms of energy that we use today and in the UK alone and, and elsewhere for that matter most of the nuclear fleet that was built 40 50 years ago is going to reach the end of its life so the demand for clean energy is unprecedented uh, the demand for electricity generation that is both clean and low cost and importantly dependable is, is going to become much, much more prominent in, in the many, many years ahead. Uh, and we, we certainly see our SMR has been designed specifically to, to address that market. Because frankly, nuclear is the cleanest and safest form of power generation that's out there. Now we've, we've, used, we've used sometimes the issues of waste in nuclear as a reason in the public discourse for not doing more nuclear while at the same time we produce energy with fossil fuels, which creates about eight to nine million deaths a year uh, from air pollution. Um, and, and that's something we've got to try and try and address. Now, the, the, the consequences of not having nuclear in the grid are already being seen today with the impacts on climate change that we've got today. And for us, waste is a very well-regulated, well-managed and well-defined part of our programs. It's funded in the cost of electricity in the UK for nuclear. Uh, and the waste from a single SMR can fill an Olympic sized swimming pool uh, over that 60 year life. Um, and the other statistic I like to use is if you were to use as a, as a human in your life, life cycle for say 80 years, uh, nuclear as a source of all your energy needs, the waste that you would produce in your lifetime uh, from nuclear would be enough to fill a, a, a can of coke or where I come from, a can of iron brew. Um, so that's the, that's the footprint of nuclear waste that's created by an individual over, over their lifetime. So nuclear has to do a better job at portraying itself as the cleanest and safest form of power generation. And, and for, for folks in the industry, you know, like we talked about at COP26 with the Young Generation Network, like the work that's done in the IMACE, We've got to bring that kind of narrative to life because unless people realize and understand the value and the impact that nuclear has in terms of moving to net zero, we're going to continue to struggle to, to build up that momentum. Uh, the other thing that's quite unique about nuclear and particularly ISMR is the ability to provide a form of firm, clean power, power that's always on. Uh, and we talk a lot about LCOE as a number to compare offshore wind and nuclear, that, that isn't an apples to apples comparison because you're comparing one marginal turbine on an intermittent offshore renewable field with what is effectively a 60 year source of base load energy. So when you do that firm power comparison, you have to start adding in lots of plus plus uh, to get to a comparable, uh, let's say renewable with storage solution or renewable with storage and hydrogen uh, solution to try to create a dependable always on solution um, uh, and that's when you start to then see the cost competitiveness and the compelling nature of our SMR uh, when you look at those other those other options. If you look at this picture here hopefully you'll agree that's not what you would expect a nuclear power plant to look like uh, and because of the scale of this because of the size of this 
we've really tried to make this something that has a positive impact on the landscape and create something that's a more iconic structure that, that can hopefully stand the test of time. These assets are going to be in our in our communities and on sites for, for many, many, many decades. And, and, I, and I look back at you know, places like Tate Britain, uh, which again is an iconic structure in London that used to be a power plant. Battersea Power Station is still an iconic structure in, in London that used to be a power plant. There's no reason why we can't think of how a power plant uh, comes across into its landscape as we design it and see hopefully we've truly really tried to, to bring design uh, to the forefront of how this technology uh, looks when it when it's built. And so what is it we're doing with an SMR? Why is it different? Well, the big difference in our SMR approach, and we are quite unique, I think, in this regard, but we are probably at the largest end of the spectrum of SMR technology, at about 470 megawatts. Um, you've got SMRs out there that are 5, 10 megawatts. So we are, we are clearly at the largest end of the spectrum. And we get to that size by basically driving for one of the fundamental features of our design, which is that it's a factory built product, a factory built commodity. So we've tried to drive as much activity into a factory environment as we possibly can to minimize and eradicate the complexity of construction that has become a real kind of impact and a real challenge for larger, larger programs. So by building the single largest product in the factory and still being able to transport it by road, we end up with a, a diameter of vessel for our reactor. Uh, and based on that diameter, we can put in so much fuel. And with that much fuel, we can produce so much thermal energy. And from that thermal energy, we get 470 megawatts. So it's the biggest reactor you can design that adheres to that factory principle and allows everything that we build in the factory to be road transportable to site. So we don't need heavy marine offloading facilities. We don't need large... Uh, marine facilities or, or special transportation solutions to get the factory built components and modules to the site. Um, and, and that's really the, the, that kind of central element of what we've done because this isn't technology for technology's sake, which you can, you can find out there as well. There's lots of people with great ideas about doing different things with nuclear technology and creating new forms of nuclear, nuclear reaction and nuclear fuels. We've not gone down that path because our goal was to bring something to market that met the needs of consumers. And so we set out with basically four criteria. One was it had to be low cost. We had to de deliver a cost competitive solution to consumers. Uh, the second was it had to be deliverable, had to be deployable with confidence. We couldn't come up with a solution that was complex to build or, or, or inherently risky to, 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 get, to get built. Uh, and we had to build something that was scalable. You know, the, the, we talked about the demand for electricity as being unprecedented in the future. And so we've got to build something that we can then deploy globally and we can scale up. Uh, and then we've also got to make something, the fourth point being quite important, that's investable. We ultimately want to get to a place where this type of product, our SMR, is not dependent on government funding decisions every time somebody wants to build one. So we can bring in private capital, we can create different structures and make this technology available to customers who wouldn't otherwise have had the ability to to contemplate a 20 billion pound large nuclear facility. So those low cost, deliverable, scalable, investable criteria, are what we've used to come up with this design. And so we're using at the heart of this proven technology. So we get to a low cost solution by using a standard PWR, using standard fuel. Again, something that's very similar to what we do in submarines and we know uh, very well. Uh, in fact, if anything, this is a less complex design than the designs we have in the, in the, in the nuclear submarine fleet. Um, so it's something we know well and we understand how to design it and how to build it. Uh, and that, that, that is a really important factor in keeping the cost down. As well as that, at 470 megawatts, so most of the steam turbine island, the balance of plant, the cooling water, we can buy that equipment off the shelf effectively. It's commercially available products that exist today from multiple suppliers in an existing supply chain. So we've already spoken to about five or six companies who could readily supply us a steam turbine that meets our need. It doesn't require the world's largest steam turbine or something bespoke. It's an available off the shelf uh, solution that can be provided by multiple companies. And so by doing that, we again keep the cost down uh, as one of our central tenants. The, 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 the delivery objective is met by 
using modularization wherever possible by using modern manufacturing techniques and by driving as much of the activity into the factory environment as possible where we can then innovate, we can maximize productivity, uh, we can create a different work environment. And so that factory environment is, is essential to us delivering a product with more confidence. And then that factory footprint gives us something that's scalable. So we'll deliver our first unit, uh, hopefully by 2031. But at that point, we've built the factory architecture and we can make two units a year. So a thousand megawatts a year from that factory footprint. And if we need to increase that supply because of demand, we just build more factories. So it's an entirely scalable product. And each of the factories is making the same product with the same people, regardless of where that, where that, where that plant is going to be built because of the innovative a seismic bearing feature we've got in this technology. And then again, with that factory predictability and transfer of knowledge, we're able to provide customers with something that is able to attract capital. And that's what you see the section through this picture here shows that reaction island, reactor island, <clears throat> sorry, the turbine island and our cooling water system. Interestingly, on the cooling water side, what we've tried to do is, is utilize as a base design cooling towers that further minimizes the need to extract seawater creating less impact on the environment, but it also maximizes the flexibility on where we can locate these SMRs. Again, there you can see the kind of compact footprint, keeping the footprint compact, keeping the size of the site activity uh, simplified and condensed reduces costs as well uh, and minimizes the, the needed activity on, on groundworks and, and, and associated infrastructure. We talk a lot about factories and we've effectively got four factories. You can see three of them on here. One is the factory for building our heavy pressure vessels. So very similar to our PCO facilities that you can, you can look at in our, in our Derby uh, facilities for some of you guys who might work there. So that, this would be a very similar factory to PCO that would build and manufacture the heavy pressure vessels for, for our SMR. We'd bring in the, the forgings from somewhere like Sheffield Forge Master who'd, that had been machined in advance and then we would build the that the final heavy pressure vessel components within that factory. We would then have a number of module factories. So we've got two standardized modules that would then be on the back of trucks, taking those modules to site. And we bring all the components together in the, in, from the supply chain into that factory environment uh, to build those modules with the pumps, vessels, piping, valves, instrumentation, CNI uh, in the factory. In some cases, commission it in the factory as well, and then deliver those modules to site to be assembled. Similarly, we're trying to minimize the amount of construction activity and civil activity on site by pushing as much of the civil works into the civil modular factories. And we've been working with Lang O'Rourke on, on how to do that and using their, their civil module factories that they've got already up in, uh, in workshop. Um, and then the fourth factory, it's not on here, is our site factory. So the first thing we do on site is also build a factory uh, so that all the work we do after we come out of the ground on site is done inside factory conditions that has a minimum impact then on the environment in terms of light and dust and noise pollution, but allows us then to bring that innovative working, that high productivity into all the work we do on site as well. And you can see here, just by doing that, you can see the side pictures here, the site factory going up, a bit like the site factory, a bit like the facilities that exist at Barrow at British Aerospace, a big, big facility that can actually be used for multiple units. So we take the site factory down and use it again on other, other deployments elsewhere. But the site factory then protects us from the elements on site. And that can have a massive impact on our productivity, especially in the UK where the weather is, particularly in the winter months, uh, can create a lot of downtime due to rain or wind or snow or ice. Uh, and so having that site factory has a big boost to our productivity and a, and a corresponding benefit to our costs. Um, so all those factories kind of play an important role. And then we start the units up and commission it. I think keep in mind that we're not a reactor designer that's selling a reactor concept to somebody to make and deliver to somebody else to build it. What we're doing at Rolls-Royce SMR is delivering a fully integrated turnkey nuclear power plant. Factory built, brought to site and assembled, started up and commissioned and then handed over to our customer under a single contract to then operate that asset over its lifetime to produce either good electricity or off-grid power for other applications. So that's a very other, another feature we've got, which is very compelling is that we're not just selling a component, we're offering our customers a fully integrated nuclear power plant. We 
are the systems engineer, we are the integrator, we're managing the logistics and the supply chain uh, interfaces, and we take responsibility for bringing together all those components and modules onto the site to build the power plant. Again, that's a very compelling solution when it comes to trying to raise private capital to finance these types of projects. But equally, within Rolls-Royce SMR, you can get a sense of the <clears throat> variety of technology and engineering challenges that we'll be facing as we take this technology both through the GDA, but as we then engineer a product that can be delivered, not just in the UK, but globally. So lots of exciting opportunities for engineering uh, skills and engineering careers within this industry. And one that is a UK solution that can be exported around the world. So I've, I've had the benefit in my career uh, to spend uh, about 17 years internationally building and delivering power plants, either from a German technology provider or an American technology provider. Uh, so actually to, to have something that we can then take around the world and export it and deliver uh, from the UK, it will be made in the UK, delivered by UK engineering teams, delivered by a site people on site helping to build these facilities globally. Again, exciting career prospects and career opportunities uh, for people in our industry in the UK today. Uh, again, going back to that single contract basis, because of that single contract, because of our ability to integrate and manage the systems engineering, because of our ability to drive construction risk out of the design and, and move into a factory environment, it's a completely different risk proposition to, to investors that hopefully will help us to then attract capital. And whereas we used to call about EPC contracts, engineer, procure, construct, we talk about ours as an EMA, engineer, manufacture, and assemble. So a different way of doing things when it comes to building nuclear. So again, this is identifying the type of opportunities that we're going to create across the UK. Uh, and we make no apology for the fact that we are a UK solution. We're a UK design and UK IP. We're going to create UK factories that will manufacture nuclear content and power plant systems, will produce modules, uh, and that will be for the UK market, but importantly, also for the export market. So we're going to contribute to the UK economy as well by delivering components and, and power plants from UK factories to customers around the world. So this is a global export opportunity, creating long-term, sustainable, and richly rewarding engineering careers within, within this business. The global opportunities are already uh, manifest in the conversations we're having today. That will increase further as people start to, to look at how they address net zero uh, and the role that nuclear can play. If there's a solution that can make it uh, digestible for them, which is what our SMR does, we're confident that more and more countries will look to our SMR as a way to help them meet their clean energy needs. And also, when you look at the cost competitiveness, I already mentioned offshore and the plus plus aspects to do a firm power comparison. But depending on the cost of capital, we get anywhere between 35 to 50, maybe slightly higher for the first few units as we build the technology out. But if you look at that compared to offshore wind with battery storage, uh, and for those consumers who need a 24 7 source of clean energy from 2030 onwards, the cost competitiveness of what we're doing is very compelling. So in summary, that's, that's who we are, that's what we're doing. It's probably the largest SMR that's out there and I've explained to you why. It's a 50 hertz design, but equally we expect and will eventually have a 60 hertz model that will go into the US and other 60 hertz markets. Proven technology, turnkey power plant, what you see on the picture is what we deliver as Rolls-Royce SMR. We've got a much more condensed construction timeline for the, for the nth unit. Uh, we've got all the generation three plus levels of safety in here around passive safety, walk away safe. Expecting to have the first unit on the grid by the early 2030s if we get an order in the next 12 months. Capital cost is under 2 billion um, and it's a really got multifunctional uh, application uh, with a very cost competitive price. So I will, I will pause there and I'll hand back over to Anthony who can hopefully uh, facilitate the Q&A. Thank you very much, Tom. That's absolutely great. I mean, we've had lots of questions started to flood in now, so I'll get straight to it. Um, I guess the first one, how does Rolls-Royce's SMR differ or compete with new scales offering? Well, I think what, we, what I mentioned before about the fact that we're offering a fully integrated turnkey solution, that's the first difference. So new scale, GE, Hitachi, they see themselves as uh, NSSS or nuclear safety systems uh, uh, OEMs, so they're designers of the nuclear 
<clears throat> reactor on Nuclear Island. New Scale is not going to take a contract to build a nuclear power plant for any customer or our GE Ataxi. They'll look to a Fleur or a Bechtel or somebody else to then construct it and build around their technology and they'll look to somebody else to manufacture it, they'll outsource it to the supply chain. That inherently has lots of the same risks and interface challenges that large has today, although on a smaller scale. So it's quite a different proposition by bringing to market a fully integrated turnkey solution. Um, GE Hitachi is a, a BWR design. Um, it's been shrunk down from their, their larger BWR solutions. Um, and New Scales is an integrated reactor design, something that we designed in Rolls Royce back in the 1980s. But we decided that was a very complicated thing to manufacture. It's basically where you wrap around your steam generator with a helical coil structure around your reactor pressure vessel into a single integrated vessel. And they're much smaller in me megawatts, so there's lots of the modules of those, but equally they're very large and, and complex in size. So the modular modularization that new scale have is in modules of say 60, 70 megawatts. Our modularization is done at the power plant level. Okay, brilliant. So one, we obviously talked a lot about the factory built aspect. Do we have an understanding of kind of the cost reduction that gives us in comparison to a kind of bespoke built power plant or SMR? Yeah, well, if you look at the, the projections that we've got, and again, we've got a lot of cost analysis behind us. We've had to go through, as you can imagine, to secure the grant funding from UKRI, extensive due diligence. We've had due diligence done by our shareholders. So we've, we've fully expl explained all of our cost analysis. And again, our costs are based on our knowledge of the technology from submarines, our knowledge of what it costs to build factories as Rolls Royce, our knowledge with people like Lang O'Rourke and Bam Nuttall on how to build a site factory and make civil modules. So our, the inputs we've got into our costs are, are pretty well defined. Clearly there's a lot of the modularization piece that's yet to be kind of fully fleshed out. So there's some, some contingency and margin around that. But we look at the total picture of our costs, we're around about 50 to 60 pounds a megawatt hour <clears throat> with, a, with a traditionally financed solution. <clears throat> and that's about half the cost of Hinkley Point C in terms of pounds per megawatt hour. So we see that as a very you know, demonstration of our competitiveness as a modular, smaller, low cost design attributes bearing that that outcome as part of our solution. Great. So there's one here on using existing sites. So I know you've kind of touched on location. Um, is, is the aim for the SMR to be deployed where, I guess, previous power stations have been decommissioned and have we has that been considered as part of the design where we could integrate those existing sites? Yeah, very much so. I think one of the key things to mention on the sites is one of the, the common features across all the sites is they have an aseismic bearing. And the aseismic bearing is designed to, to accommodate the site characteristics such that everything above the aseismic bearing is the same. So the product we make in the factory is the same regardless of which site it goes on because of the aseismic bearing concept. We, we've got three, three categories of sites where we're planning to deploy this technology in the UK, and I think it's the same elsewhere. They may not have the first category if it's a newcomer country. Our first category is the nuclear decommissioned estate, um, including, including some of the uh, gigawatt sites that are no longer in active development. So there's already a nuclear estate there that is ideally placed, and where are some of those locations weren't suitable for gigawatt deployment, they're very well suited to the size of SMR, about 500 and 470 megawatts. So they've already got existing grid connection, they've already got existing water infrastructure that we can tap into. So that's very much a part of that kind of decision making process. Um, the second category is decommissioned coal plants. Again, coal assets across the UK that have run for, for many, many decades have got a good connection, have got a cooling water architecture, we could look at deploying SMRs within that vicinity and take advantage of those existing connections as well. The third area is places like industrial footprints where in refineries or other places where we currently process oil and gas, we could put an, an SMR in there and help those facilities to produce clean fuels, hydrogen, synthetic fuels, and, and look at an SMR becoming a source of clean energy for 60 years that can be turned, converted into other clean, clean products. And that, that, that's the kind of three categories in the UK. There are, there are many, many opportunities across that industrial coal and nuclear estate in the UK to host many, many SMRs. In other countries, take for example, Poland, there's a big market there. They've got lots of coal estate, lots of lignite combined heat and power plants, about 300, 400 megawatts. 
that are ideally suited then to, to take power from an SMR. So it depends on the country, but they were the kind of three categories, decommissioned nuclear sites, coal plants and industrial locations. Brilliant. So there's a couple of questions here just on kind of IP uh, and national security. So obviously there's a desire for global deployment. And I think what you've said is we kind of need that for, for cost scalability. How do we manage the IP and the national security considerations given where a lot of the expertise has come from, um, given the Rolls-Royce submarines links? Yeah, well, for, firstly, the, the Rolls-Royce submarine technology is a separate, separate part of Rolls-Royce. That's not what we're, we're using here, but we've taken that knowledge base to design something for this application. So there's no, there's no correlation between that defence business and, and what we're doing here in terms of IP or technology. We've transferred all the people now and the SMR IP into the Rolls-Royce SMR Limited. We operate under strict export control regimes. Uh, any country at which, in which we intend to sell an SMR would have to be fully signed up to all the appropriate nuclear international treaties. It'd have to follow the IAEA guidelines on what would need to be in place in country before we can start engaging with them. But the, the, the real fact is the export control regime protects and manages that uh, the, the, the management of nuclear information and pr the prolif proliferation risks. Okay, great. So just moving now on to, I guess, kind of public perception on nuclear. So there's a couple of questions around this. Uh, is this, is the, the Rolls-Royce SMR business doing anything to kind of support that positive public perception around nuclear? Because obviously some of the sites you've talked about, they're kind of used to there being nuclear generating power stations there. So so that so so it make it a bit of an easier place to pick um and in terms of the risk level f for nuclear power stations there's a question here does the design eliminate risks of the nuclear disaster like fukushima um well i think the risks 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 exist and have to be managed and designed uh, out and we have to obviously design beyond design basis events our design includes many of the, uh, the safety features that have been identified across the industry post Fukushima. We have a number of passive safety features in there, as well as other, other layers of protection and safety features that reflect what came out of the, the learnings and experience from, from Fukushima. So absolutely, yes. Communities that are closest to nuclear assets are the strongest advocates for nuclear assets. They understand the technology, they realize and can see the economic benefits. Uh, and so I think that is that is a really compelling case for other communities who have contemplated hosting an SMR to see those benefits as well. We, we will have to confront that in the future, but for the time being, our initial deployments are going to be across those nuclear decommissioned estates. So we're going to hopefully be able to prove what that looks like and deliver against that. Uh, and as, in parallel to that, have those conversations with the coal sites and other communities that have not had a nuclear asset. Uh, and we will have to do a more prominent role of having that conversation in the public domain through Rolls-Royce SMR Limited. Hopefully people can see our new website, they can see our LinkedIn facilities. We're now active on social media, we're active in the press. And so hopefully by beginning this conversation, we can describe to people what our SMR is, how it functions and try and address some of those perceptions in those communities that are not as familiar with nuclear yet. Okay. So a bit more of, I guess, a technical design question I, I, i'll ask it I'll ask it anyway so rather than enriched uranium have rolls-royce smr considered the use of kind of uranium salts or molten salt reactors instead as a technology for the smr yeah so again we when we started this journey back in 2015 you no know, rolls-royce we, we we tried to secure components and scope within the gigawatt space and we tried to get business from all the gigawatt activities that were out there with foreign technologies that were active in the UK, but it really didn't manifest in any real meaningful UK content for us. And that's when we decided we have to come up with our own design and look at a UK, a UK reactor technology solution that we can then deliver here and export globally. But we started with a blank sheet of paper. We didn't have any solution that we were trying to build around. We looked at molten salt, we looked at new scale, we looked at other technologies. Uh, and as I said, we looked at addressing four criteria so the design has been influenced by those market criteria and so when it look when you look at other types of nuclear fuel molten salt there isn't an existing fuel supply network there isn't an existing waste cycle so you in bringing that technology to market you require that host nation or that community to then invest in all those other things that don't exist today which has a big burden on on deployment so what we've decided to do is 
use existing technology, PWR, with existing standard uh, enriched uranium fuel, which is readily available and all the waste streams are readily understood and manageable. Uh, and that helps us then to drive down the cost and improve uh, delivery certainty by eradicating and, or avoiding the introduction of innovative and unnecessary technology risk. Because if you look holistically at this, Anthony, we achieved huge technology breakthroughs when we split the atom and produced nuclear power in the, in the 40s and 50s. I mean, that, that in itself is a remarkable thing that we've done. Uh, and by capturing the heat through a PWR using standard fuel and, and with all the safety features, that isn't the thing we're trying to solve. What we're trying to solve is how do we build them on time and on budget and deploy them at scale across the world? And so that's why we've designed our SMR to be a factory built solution, modular in the extreme, using modern methods of manufacture, eradicating construction risk. They're the things we had to solve. And that's why we designed our SMR that way. It's not about trying to get a better way of you know, splitting the atom and producing heat. That's a pretty cool solution already. Let's use that, it works. And let's solve the other challenges by doing the modularization and modern methods of manufacturing. Okay. So on to, I guess, a longer term view. Will Rolls-Royce SMR be providing through life support in terms of supporting outages and necessary refueling and mandatory inspections, or will that be kind of passed on to the operator? Well, clearly our, op our customers will own and operate these assets, but we will absolutely have a role to play as Rolls-Royce SMR in providing services, outage management support, uh, other technology and design support to the fleet uh, globally as it goes forward. Clearly, Exelon are now a shareholder in Rolls-Royce SMR. They may also become an operator for this technology with some of our customers if our customers have not got a nuclear operating capability. So that's a really helpful addition to our, to our toolkit. But yes, there will be hopefully additional service and support revenue from the build-out of the fleet globally. Uh, and we will be developing those solutions to give to our customers in due course. Okay, brilliant. So on that kind of fleet deployment question, got one here from Chris that says, with only two being built per year, or two I guess, SMRs being built per year, how will we prioritize, how will you prioritize who secures access to the first SMR? Well, they're, 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 they're not quite queuing around the corner yet, uh, Chris, <laughs> but hopefully we'll get, we'll get to that point. And I think you're touching on a really interesting phenomenon, which is when we build the factory and we're producing two a year, we're gonna be selling slots so you, you want an SMR, you have to pick your slot. It's like what happened when we when the 9FAs and the, the big gas turbines were produced by the Siemens and the GEs of the world. You had to secure your slot in the production line. I think we'll probably end up something similar with SMRs in the future where customers will need to make a commitment early enough to secure the slot, depending on when they want the SMR on their grid. But keep in mind, it's a scalable solution. So as that demand does increase and we see overseas export orders coming in, we then can build a second set of factories in the UK or a third set of factories in the UK, or based on where that regional demand is for the technology, let's say in Turkey, for example, they may have a demand for 20 units. We might be able to build some modular factories in that part of the world and create a kind of regional hub um, as, as the business grows globally. Okay. Brilliant. So just go, kind of going back, I know we've briefly touched on new scale. Who, who do you see as your biggest competitor if you like at this point well, in time yeah i think when it comes to 50 hertz uh, there, i don't think there's anybody as far advanced as we are we've we've sent our application into the onr to begin the gda process two weeks ago we've got 490 million of capital lined up to come in over the next three and a half years to help us uh, progress through that process and we're now focusing on securing revenue from sales in the coming 12 to 18 months so um, we're ready to go to market now. We don't need to wait for the GDA to be complete before we can then sell this technology in the marketplace. So when it comes to 50 hertz, I think we are, we're at the front, front, uh, front of the, uh, the market. There are Russian and Chinese solutions out there, but they, they come with other, other challenges. Uh, and obviously in the US, New Scale has gone through the NRC process. So they've gone through a, a more uh, uh, of their design process. They've spent a lot more money than us. They've been a, a longer time than us. So they're, they're probably ahead of us in terms of NRC status. But again, it comes back to how do you sell a product to customers that they want to buy that's manageable on an integrated turnkey basis. We think that's a big differentiator for us as well. Okay. And, and in terms of kind of regulatory approval, do you see there being any kind of major challenges with 
taken the design through the GDA process here in the UK? Um, and is there anything that you need to work with the regulator on, given that this is the first kind of, I guess, British designed um, nuclear <coughs> power or nuclear reactor in decades? Yeah. Yeah, no, you're absolutely not. And that's, isn't that a great thing to say that we've now got a UK design going through the GTA with the UK regulator? I think the regulator is looking forward to that. They've had, they've had a Japanese design, they've had an American design, they've had a French design, they've had a Chinese design, all designs that were regulated elsewhere that had to be shoehorned into the UK requirements, which is quite painful. We've, we're going into this process with a deep knowledge of the UK regulatory requirements. We're going through a process where the design will run concurrently with regulatory approval so we can adapt and adopt the regulatory outcomes as we go through the design. We understand what the regulator will and won't accept. So we understand there'll need to be hardwired safety systems. So we build that in at the start. By building it in at the start, it doesn't have a major, major disadvantage to our cost or our deployment because we've designed it in from the beginning. Some of the other technologies have had to fight some of those issues because it's not part of their design in other jurisdictions. So I, I think that will be a good process for us. We've had extensive engagement during phase one with the regulator. Uh, we've shown them and shared with them what we're planning to bring through the process, which has helped them understand what we're bringing to the table. Um, and I think, as I say, we're using proven technology, PWR, standard fuel. Uh, the, the UK process is rigorous and it is going to be challenging, but we've got a very extensive and experienced team here. Helena Perry has just joined us from Westinghouse, who's been through the GDA on the AP1000. She's been through the GDA process and worked on Horizon in the past. So we're building a really capable team that will take that GDA process forward, backed by Matt Blake and the engineering team that are going to be presiding, providing the design basis that will go into that process. So I've got every confidence that we'll get through that GDA process successfully. It will be onerous. It will be challenging. That's the nature of regulation. But keep in mind, when we get that uh, status of DAC and SODA for this technology, that will be a huge badge of honour globally as, as the UK regulator is seen as probably the high watermark on, on, UK, on, on nuclear regulations globally. Brilliant. So uh, we've got loads of questions coming in, so I'm going to have to pick and choose given we've only got 10 minutes or five, 10 minutes left. We've got an interesting one here on concrete. So in, in a re reduced carbon world, have we investigated using alternative materials um, to concrete? Obviously, people know concrete generates quite a significant amount of CO2. Yes, yes, we, we, we are. We're, we're looking at ways in which we can have low, low CO2 concrete. We're looking at ways we have less concrete, uh, looking at ways where we can use steel uh, in the design and, and look at that modularization uh, philosophy around how they build offshore rigs and oil and gas experiences. So all those ideas are being explored uh, from an engineering perspective in, in the teams right now. And, and that's definitely part of our... Our, our objective here is to also have a low impact design that has a minimum CO2 built into the asset as we construct it. Brilliant. So I'd like to just move on, I guess, to, to, to a few questions we've got on, I guess, opportunities going forward. And um, there's obviously a lot of young engineers on the call who may be interested in, in the industry uh, and their careers going forward. What, what, are our what are your plans, Tom, to support rapid talent acquisition um, over the next kind of few years and, and specifically with attracting a young talent? Yeah, so uh, absolutely. The, the, the growth that we've got ahead of us over the next three or four years is enormous. So we do need to attract talent. We need to make sure we're seen as a, a great place to come and work. So we're working right now on building that culture and that environment where we want to make this a, a really exciting place to work where the challenges and the opportunities are unparalleled elsewhere in the business and so that's really incumbent on us and that we can offer a, a very flexible and, and, and uh, rewarding experience for, for, for new new engineers and other uh, career uh, opportunities that come into our to our organization we've got a dedicated talent management team within the business uh, uh, under Adam Ellis and Michael Fidiman uh, we're using the the LinkedIn channels to to recruit we're working with uh, a number of uh, uh, specific recruiters to help build the business around people like uh, Morrison's and AWS and, uh, and a few others. But LinkedIn channels are the, probably the first starting point. Uh, we'll be identifying the, the positions uh, in due course through that process. And we do have a huge demand for for engineering talent, helping with the engineering design, helping with the V&V, helping with the GDA, with the regulator. We have a desire for bringing in engineering talent to help us develop opportunities globally to sell the technology, business development talent, 
uh, communications, corporate affairs, uh, social media talent to help promote the technology globally. So there are a whole raft of opportunities. Um, and as somebody who began my career designing power plants in the UK and had the opportunity to work internationally in places like Hong Kong and, and China as a young engineer, I, that's what really excites me about what we're doing in Rolls-Royce SMR. You can come to Rolls-Royce SMR, you can work on a UK technology and a UK design, and eventually you could go and help them be delivered and, and commissioned and started up all over the world. And so that, that most engineers I know are, are excited by uh, what's out there in the world and, and having done a career and a company that's going to be active in that global clean energy space with a purpose that's so clearly tied to clean energy and net zero that I think we'll hopefully, we'll hopefully be able to attract the best talent in this country and bring them into our business and grow. Brilliant. And just so people are aware, where, where will, if there are, I guess, opportunities available, where can people find them and where will they be based? Uh, so we've got two, two current uh, hubs. We've got the hub in Derby, which is where most of our engineering team are currently based. And we've got additional space there in Jubilee House that we're taking on board to allow us to expand. We've got a, a team in Warrington and space there to grow as well. And that's where Helena and the GDA team will be based there, a bit closer to the regulator in Bootle. Uh, we're probably going to create a, a headquarters or an office in Manchester so we can then grow again some of the corporate functions, but also other engineering and GDA resources to support Warrington and Derby. Uh, and so I think they'll become our three, three key, key areas, uh, you know, Warrington, Derby, and, and, and a, grow, a growth area potentially as well in, in Manchester, which I find very exciting. No, Mr. Rose met Mr. Royce at the Midland Hotel in Manchester. And to have a presence there with something as exciting as this, I'm sure both of those, uh, both of those uh, founders of the of Rolls Royce would have been extremely excited about, would be, would be quite iconic as well. Brilliant. I'm sure people will be on the lookout for what's available going forward. Given the time, I'll just, I'll just ask one more question then. Um, again, apologies to, to questions I haven't asked. We've had an absolute flood of questions. This is kind of about the first power station assets. Does Rolls-Royce SMR foresee taking any equity stake in, in those first um, power plant assets, particularly the first adopters? Um, not, not right now. That isn't, that isn't part of our business plan. But what we are doing right now is helping to establish a development company that can facilitate the deal architecture and create the projects that will then have the financial capital within them to, to then deliver these projects and deliver our SMR. And they will become our customer that we would then sign up to deliver an SMR contract with. Um, so we, we, we're not intending to become an owner and operator of, of nuclear assets, but we do need to make sure that we facilitate the introduction of private capital. Exelon are going to be the operator if people need them to have an operator to help make that work. And, but we are going to become more active in that developer space and helping to structure the deals to, to allow us to go forward. The, the UK hasn't really got utilities that are waiting to buy SMRs. EDF have got their own technology. E.ON have got an anti-nuclear stance because of their German uh, ownership. So what we're hoping to do is create like a nuclear IPP that attracts capital with an operator, with offtake, with sites. And, and so that will allow us then to, to move at pace and deploy the fleet more quickly. Brilliant. Thank you very much, Tom. I think it's, it's great the amount of questions we're getting and kind of obvious enthusiasm of all the engineers on the call. It's great to see. I think we'll, we'll leave it there today, given the time. I'm sure everyone's got kind of meetings to be in at one o'clock. Um, so... I guess I'd just like to say thank you very much, Tom, for, for, for your time today and coming to tell us about the Rolls-Royce SMR um, and how it's going to support the, the journey to net zero in the UK, um, but not just the UK globally, I guess. Um, hopefully the audience enjoyed it and all the attendees found this useful. Uh, I'm sure they did, given the amount of questions we've been asked. Um, and it looks like there's some fantastic opportunities uh, in the sector going forward. So I guess everyone keep an eye out. Uh, you've, you've mentioned the website, you've mentioned the LinkedIn site uh, where people can follow, follow up there. So yeah, I guess finally, Tom, I guess thank you again for coming and supporting us um, and also to the attendees for coming and asking some, some great questions today. And I hope everyone has uh, enjoys the rest of their day. Thanks very much, Anthony. Well done, mate. Thank you. Super. Thanks, everyone.